Hello and welcome back to Uroru Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. When I last left you, Adel and her companion were just about to go into battle against the dreaded Kias, and we don't know what will happen there. I had intended to make the, the conclusion of this series uh, quite a bit earlier than I have done so. The reason was I went to my mother-in-law's house for New Year's. We don't actually celebrate Christmas here that very much, but we do celebrate New Year's and so I dutifully went down with my wife to my mother-in-law's house and we had car trouble, unfortunately, so I got stuck there. So I've just got back this weekend and I finally have a chance to finish up this recording. So I hope you'll enjoy it. The other thing I wanted to say as well is you'll notice quite a difference in the audio quality from the this kind of patching in that I'm doing compared to the normal recording. And there's quite a few reasons for that. I'm hoping to improve the audio quality as we move forward, but it's kind of an iterative process and I'm learning a lot as I go. So I hope you, you will bear with me as I improve the quality of these recordings. Anyway, having said all that, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode and I'll try to make uh, episodes more frequently in the future. All right, so they've kind of turned. So I'm going to try, you can see the brown area here is where they're not, the red area is where they're actually looking. The brown area is where they have kind of per peripheral vision. And this area where it's just a normal color is where they're not looking at all. So I want to try and stay in the area where they're not looking at all and try and sneak up, them, up on them as much as possible. So now I go next to one of these guys. Now if I attack this Kia, then my companion will also start attacking. And since she has a crossbow, she will be very effective against these birds. Because if I try to attack a bird, it's likely to fall, fly away. Combat in Dwarf Fortress is very similar to combat in other roguelikes in that if I just walk into the Kia, it will attack. But you almost never want to do that in this game because this this game actually has implemented a very strategic combat system uh, or very tactical I suppose as opposed to strategic and it's very complicated at first sight like everything else in the game but it's actually quite fun and it's quite interesting because it allows you to use a lot of your own brain power to improve your situation so the first thing I did is I press capital A and it comes back and asks us do you really want to attack in conflict with this. So this is actually starting a conflict with the thin Kia. To confirm, you want to say Alt Y. So I say, yes, I do actually want to do it. And now there's three things I can do. I can strike, I can wrestle, and I can dodge. Wrestling is often a good idea in certain circumstances. I'm not going to do that right now because I've got my shield. If I had an open hand, then it's quite useful to do some wrestling, but I'm going to actually keep my shield on because I don't have a helmet, I'm a bit worried that I may run into a problem. If the Kia actually attacks me in the head and knocks me out by some fluke, then it will probably kill me, <laughs> which is really frustrating. Uh, if you've actually seen a Kia in real life, you probably think that's just not possible. But it is possible. So I'm going to strike with my battle axe. And what you'll see is that there are things you can you can hit easily, there's things that are difficult to hit, and there are things that are impossible to hit. What we want to do is we want to, we want to choose something that's relatively easy to hit and that will do some damage. Now unfortunately you'll see that we don't really have a good combination. Now if I actually use slash and star to go to the next pages, and I think I have to use star to go to the next one, you can see that I can, I can also attack their toes their beak or their tongue. Tricky strike is easier than difficult strike and so I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and go for the lower body. And the reason we go for the lower body is that if you hit the lower body you can make them nauseous and if they're nauseous then they will be slow and this is usually a good attack to go and since it's a tricky strike rather than difficult strike and we can hit fairly solidly then that's our way to go. So I'm going to do that. And I've got a few different ways to go. I can hack with my battle axe. I can slap with the flat of the battle axe, or I can strike with the pommel of the battle axe. I can also hit with my shield, or I can punch. In this particular case, I think we'll just hit with the copper battle axe for now. If we manage to open an artery, then 
and it might bleed. I silently hack the thin kia in the lower body from behind with my copper battle axe, tearing apart the muscle and tearing apart the stomach. Now you'll see that it's been propelled away by the force of the blow. So I'm standing here and the kia is standing here. So it's gonna be moving in this direction. And this is a little bit of a pain because it means that we're going to have to chase it. So I am going to move forward. So the thin kia's upper body skids along the ground, bruising the muscle and bruising the liver. So the thin kia slams into an ob obstacle, which was nice. So that means he stopped. You'll notice that he has a blue exclamation mark. And what that means is that he's frightened. And when they're frightened, that means that they have less ability to fight. This is good for us. So the other thing we can do is we can actually look at him. So if I look at the thin kia, you'll notice that it's now says lethal, a thin kia. What that means is that he will fight to the death. The reason he'll fight to the death is because we've attacked him with a deadly weapon. If we'd punched him, he may actually think about leaving us alone, like maybe just brawling with us. If you attack with a lethal weapon, it escalates the encounter. And we're just going to have a quick look at them. You'll notice that they're bleeding. The lower body has some damage, the liver and the stomach. He's also, oh, I see, he's, he, he's not frightened. He's actually stunned. And stunned means that he can't fight very well as well, which is very good for us. If we look at the description, you'll see that his lower body is cut open. He's oozing blood. His liver is mangled beyond recognition. His upper body is bruised and his stomach is mangled beyond recognition. So he's actually almost dead. So we should be able to finish him off. A strike. The left wing is an easy strike. The left wing is actually not a bad choice for us at this point because potentially, even though he's badly wounded, he could fly away. So if we manage to damage the left wing, then he won't be able to run away. So let's do that. L. And now what I'm going to do is you'll notice we can, again, we'll probably hack him again, but I want to make a quick attack because if I do a quick attack, it means he has less opportunity to get away before we get our attack in. So I'm just gonna press U. So it's not as powerful, but it's faster. And I'm going to press A again to hack. And there we go. We silently hack the thin Kia in the left wing from behind with our copper battle axe and the severed part sails off in an arc. And you'll see in fact that the severed part actually did go. So if I actually look again, see up in the up left corner, we can see that it has its left wing there. Now I can't remember whether Kias are big enough to butcher. If they're big enough to butcher, it can actually be useful for us. See if I stop s sneaking, you'll see he's has a red background, which means that he's dead. So I'm going to actually just move on top of this Kia. Now, if I press X, it allows us to do something. And what we want actually want to do is we want to butcher. But unfortunately, you see nothing comes up in butcher. So we can't butcher him because he's too small, which is unfortunate. If I now look at my stats, you'll notice that I have dab dabbling ambusher. That's because we snuck up on him and attacked him. You'll see that our tracker is almost up to the next level. Um, and we didn't actually get any experience from our axe dwarf, which is unfortunate. So that's combat in, that's combat in Dwarf Fortress. Now I won't continue on with that because it's, it's a little bit boring just to kill Kias like that. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave them alone. Oh, <laughs> so our companion, whose name I forget again, Arat, has shot another Kia with, with one blow. Well done. So let's see if we can butcher this one. No. And it appears that uh, she's going to kill all of them. You'll notice that this Kia now is flashing. So the Braille kill stands up. So we move towards it. Maybe we can help it attack. The frail Kia. 
strike and we have an easy strike to the upper body so let's do that and again I'm just going to do it quickly and we're going to hack ah but he's jumped away so um, he's dodged our attack so we can try again a ah no so this is the other key so I need to move it down where is he going I must have if I look up Ah, yes, you can see, again, in the upper right-hand corner, so this is one level above, you can see the key has actually moved up, and because I don't know where the center of my screen is there, yeah, you see I have to actually move south to be able to attack him. Oh, this key is still injured. Uh, maybe I'll attack that one. Strike him, and I will do his head, why not you? Hack, we have taken off his head. So let's just have a quick look and see if we can't butcher him. I think it's probably unlikely. And no, we can't butcher him. Which is very un unfortunate because uh, we could get some food. Ah, the one that was flying away I think has been shot down somewhere. Ah yeah, there it is. That's why it's nice to have a um, an archer or a crossbowman on your team. Again, we can't butcher because they're too small. Still, we did a pretty good job. And if I again look at my skills, you can see I have increased a little bit in my axe dwarf, which makes me happy. Because we may we may run into situations where we're going to need that. And again, I should be turning on my sneakiness. So there we go. And you will see there's some eyes, which I'm assuming are ibexes, because I remember that there were ibexes in this thing. Now, ibexes are virtually impossible to kill. And the reason is because they're very fast. And it can be quite dangerous, because you, you can grab them and wrestle them, but they'll kick you in the head and kill you, which is not so good. So if I just look, let me just see if I'm correct that those are ibexes. Yeah, so those are ibexes. Now, there's one already moving away, so if I try and sneak up on this one, it may be possible. There, yeah, that's interesting. So I'm I'm right here, which if I if I have been diligent, and uh, if if subtitle Kuhn actually highlights it for you, <laughs> then he'll be able to see it easier than I can. If I'm standing here. Ibex is standing here, and he's actually moving towards me, which means. Um, I'm actually in danger of getting hit um, so I may actually just so he's actually attacking me and I'm going to dodge and I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to dodge to the east oh no he's coming down so I'm actually going to dodge south I think and that way I still have a, a chance to hit him so I press E for south and there you can see now he's moving to the right. And what I'm going to do is I'm I might put my shield away because if we if we don't wrestle him he will be gone in about two seconds. So I'm just going to uh, P says is for put away. So I'm going to put away the bismuth bronze shield and we're going to put it in the backpack. So now we have an empty hand and I'm going to attack and I'm going to wrestle. And you'll see that I have, with my left hand, I now have a, an empty hand. And empty hands are very useful for doing things. So I'm going to grab the Ibex. Now, it's a, it is a double-edged sword. Because if you grab somebody, at that point you can no longer dodge. And if you remember, most of our defense is from dodging. Uh, and we don't really have any armor and I put my shield away so this is actually quite dangerous but I'm thinking that we may actually be able to dispatch this ibex pretty quickly since I have that wonderful crossbowman with us so what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to try and grab the neck let's see I'm just trying to think it actually matters which way so we've gone south they were coming towards us he turned left so we should be able to reach their neck no problem because it actually matters. Um, they were coming towards us, which means they're facing us, which means I should be able to grab their neck. If I try to grab his tail at this point, it may be more difficult. And you'll see as well, he's turned to the right. 
he's moving right. Oh, he's turning to the right. Right now he's still facing to the southwest because that's where his cone of vision is. But he's going to move to the right next. So we could probably get his left leg or something like that. Now, this is a point where you want to press comma as well because we don't want to wait a full turn. We just want to wait until our wrestling move works. So I'm just going to do that. Ah. So I tried to I tried to grab them, but they moved away. And at this point, there is no way I'm going to catch up with his ibex. I'll try and move to the northeast. You'll see that they, he'll quickly outpace me. Yeah. Because so ibexes are just so fast. There's not there's not much we can do. Now the problem is my companion is going to go like a crazy person running after it. Now, one of the things that we can try and do, which I, I'm not sure, if I now then, if I try and talk, I may be able to tell them to stop. If I just say, cease hostilities, Arat is fairly intent in chasing this Ibex, which is very unfortunate. So I think we're gonna to have to run after her, otherwise we're gonna lose her. So I'm going to go into a sprint. That was just S again to get there. And I'm actually going to turn off the sneaking because it means I can go a little bit faster. So we're going to run. Now, one of the things is I've got pretty good endurance. So hopefully we'll be able to. But you can see that uh, Arat is way faster than us. So we've got some combat reports, even though we can't see them. You can see there's an exclamation mark up there. So that's where they are. I'm not sure what Era is doing. <laughs> okay, there they are. So Ibex is actually attacking Era, which is convenient. Ah, well done. So Era punches the Ibex in the lower body. And since the Ibex appears intent on fighting, now to remove something from your bag, press R. And I'm just going to get the business bronze shield again out because that'll give us some protection. I'm just going to run. You'll see the little arrows here. This is the directions that people are going. So they're both going towards each other. So I think I'm just going to go north. Eret scratches the ibex in the left rear leg, tearing the fat and bruising the muscle. Ibex misses Eret. So now we've got again the situation where Eret has got her crossbow out again. I'm hoping that she'll shoot. I'm just going to attack. I'm not going to attack my ally. I'm going to attack the Ibex. And I'm going to strike. I'm going to strike in the lower body. Or I may actually strike in the left front hook. And that will hopefully take them down. And again, I'm going to go quick because Ibexes are very fast and they'll run away before I get finished. And then I'm going to hack with my copper battle axe. Let's see how that works. Ah, but it glanced away. All right, let's try again. And let's try the right front leg this time. Again, we're going to do fast again. We want to go fast each time because we only have a limited number of hits. And so we want to get something in. If we can get a blood vessel, then basically we, we will win the fight. And there you go. You can see now we've, we've hacked the Ibex in the right front leg from the side with our copper battle axe, tearing apart the muscle. The artery has been opened by the attack and many nerves have been severed. So this does many good things for us. What this means is that the Ibex will be slower, um, but they're also bleeding. And if we hit it one more time, it might be bleeding enough that it will, it will die from its wounds um, without us having to do very much more. So now the Ibex is moving away from us and I'm hoping that we'll be able to, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to strike. Again, we'll try to do the left rear hoof. I am going to, this time though, I'm going to do a charge attack, which means that I'm going to move towards the, the opponent because, because the Ibex is moving away from us and I want to move towards them. So that's charge attack and I'm going to hack again. And again, it's glanced away. So I probably shouldn't go for the, the hooves because they tend to glance away. Now one of the problems here is that now it's much more difficult 
to attack because they're facing away from us and running away. So I think we're going to try and do a lower body attack again fast or sorry again we're going to do a charge attack and we're going to hack again. So we missed but we managed to collide with the Ibex and knocked it over. And so that slowed it down a little bit. So he's regaining balance. We have we have a chance now. We can maybe try with the left rear leg. We're going to do a fast attack and hack. We hit the Ibex in the left rear leg. We fractured the bone. This opened up another artery and it's fallen over and given into pain. And once it's given into pain, basically you've won. Because now when I go A, strike, I can do anything. Everything's a simple hit. And so we can just go to the head, D. We're going to do heavy attack this time, so that's V for heavy. And we're going to hack, and this will probably take the head off. But although we're not very good with our axe, so it may take a couple attacks. Ah oh, yes, we did, we did it in one stroke. Well done, Adol. And you can see here, if we look, that the head has ended up here. Now, one of the nice things about attacking the Ibex is that the Ibex is very big, and so we can actually butcher it. Go X, B for butcher. Now we have a mutilated corpse. Now what I need to do is I need to right arrow over the mutilated corpse, and I press return. Then it says, what do you want to do it with? Now you'll notice the cover battle axe is already highlighted. So in the first case, it didn't highlight it. In the second case, it does highlight it. So again, frustrating. So we want to uh, butcher it with our copper battle axe. We can use something else if we wanted. We can use our, our dagger, but it's not in hand at the moment. And it says we butcher the Ibex mutilated corpse. Now we can pick up the things that resulted from butchering. And we do that uh, by pressing G. And you'll see that there are many things that we can pick up. And you use the star and slash ones to page through. So we'll go star to get the next one. And so there's quite quite a bit of stuff. Here's some nice Ibex meat. I'm going to take that. You can eat the prepared lung and whatnot as well. But eight Ibex meat is more than enough for us. And actually, I stop sprinting. So press S again. Go back down to a walk. You'll notice my speed is 1.0. If I get carrying too much stuff, that will go down below one. And we want to keep it at one if possible. Now the other thing I'm going to do is I've got the bones sitting on the ground and I can press X here and I can actually now uh, create. Now if I press right to go into this menu and I go down to carve bone, we can carve bones. And you can carve many things. And this is, this is what you can use for trading with people at towns. What we can do is we can, for instance, make some rings or scepters. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a figurine from Ibex bone using my copper battle axe. And what you can do is you can make figurines of different things. And they're basically ways of learning about the history. Now, this is not actually constrained to your knowledge. So you can make a figurine of anything. And if you want to learn something about the history of something that you don't happen to know about, then this is actually kind of a useful way of discovering it without using legends mode. Now, what I'm going to do though, is I'm actually just going to let my mind wander and that will create a figuring. Ah, look at that. We made a, a figurine of the flickering sun, which is our deity. And if we look at it, so if I just go I, and you'll notice that S is our, our figurine. And then I look at V for the description you can see that this is a well-crafted bone figurine of the flickering sun. The images of a well-designed image of the flickering sun, the deity of day, depicted as a male dwarf and four dwarves in ibex bone. The flickering sun is striking a triumphant pose. The flickering sun is surrounded by four doors. I wonder why the flickering sun is surrounded by four doors. That's interesting. All right, and so we can just make these figurines and we can, we can sell them later. So I'm just gonna quickly just do that. Create our bone, figurine, ibex bone, copper battle axe, and I'm just going to keep making, letting my mind wander. Ah, I'm really interested in my deity, aren't I? Oh, I made a figurine of Malfold spread angles. Now, I remember that name. Uh, I have to do star to get to the next page. 
The artwork relates to the ascension of the dwarf Malfoy spread anvils to the position of king of the exalted shield. That's right. That's right. So I think Malfoy spread anvils is the current king of the exalted shield. I made a figuring of Slugman. Oh, I made a figuring of English Toolball, which I believe was the first queen. Yeah, is the ascension of English Toolball to the position of king in the, of the Exalted Shield in one. So I think English was actually a woman. I can't remember, to be honest. Now, one of the things you will notice is that these are all in my hand. So I have, I have bone figurines in my left hand. I have bone figurines in my right hand. So what I really want to do is I want to actually put those, so I put, say P, is that I'm just filling up my hands. So I want to put these in my backpack. So I say P, and then G, A, then P. And unfortunately, because it increases what's in your backpack, it changes, you have to keep going through the alphabet. It would be nice if it was the same one, but it doesn't really matter. P, I, A, P, H, I, J, Oh. Ah, now it says you don't have a suitable container. And I think that means that my backpack is full. Now you can actually put more things in your backpack than will fit in your backpack. I don't really want to exploit it. So when it gets there, I think that just basically means that your backpack is full. The thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to get this. This is a copper bolt that uh, Eric fired. She's not following me though. Yeah, this is one of those things where it's really frustrating. We haven't used fast travel mode before. I have to come down from the mountains before we can fast travel. So we have to go to the, to the site, to the south. Ah, here she's, she's following with us. So sometimes just going into fast travel mode and then going out again will fix problems like that. Now you can see there's some exclamation marks up there. I'm assuming those are more Ibexes. You'll see some of these things, which I haven't pointed out before. That's a boulder. Um, this is water. So there's a downward slope here uh, going into open space. But if I go down, you'll see that this is a stagnant pool. We can't drink water from a stagnant pool, by the way, um, because it's stagnant water. It will make you sick. And here's some R's. And I really should have my, I should be, so they're ravens. Uh, Usually I don't bother with ravens. Let me just turn my sneaking back on so you can actually see when things pop up. It really does make a huge difference to have that turned on. Because if you don't have it turned on, then you often just don't notice. They they just blend into the background. Now if I go to travel mode again. Ah, so now you can see I'm out of the mountains. So you see these big mountains here are the are so sort of these little peaks are the mountains and these ones here we're now in the prestigious desert ah we said we wanted to avoid the prestigious desert because it was dangerous uh, well hopefully we won't be in any trouble so I'm going to use the normally you don't get attacked in fast travel mode to be honest so we should be alright you notice at the top here too this is the this is the Sun traveling across the sky. This is the east and this is the west. So it's traveling and so we're still in the morning. This big gray thing here is a big storm cloud. So it was raining where we were. It's it's not raining where we are now, which is nice. And I'm just thinking that we want to go up here. Ah, no, it's raining up there as well. So I don't actually know where to go. I'm going to press M to get the map. And then you can see that we actually want to just go straight north, it seems. This road here goes over to the to the east. You also notice that there's an asterisk here, and this asterisk is some other group that's traveling. Now they could be friendly or they could be hostile. Uh, we're going to avoid them for now. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to travel along in these uh, in this forest until we get near the other fortress and then hopefully you'll also see there's this is a river this blue thing here and you'll see that it changes color here 
that's because it's a brook here. Now we can ford the brook easily, we don't have to swim. And my companion can't swim, so it's easier, or likely can't swim, so it's easier to ford the brook here rather than to swim across the river. So, And I just saw a glimpse of the city. So here we go. Now it zooms in a bit once you get close to the city. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out of map mode. If I press twice, it tells me it tells me what kind of structures are where I'm where I am. But mostly on the map, it tells you as well. You can see that there's these brown O's. There's a there's a pink O and there is a white O. And so if we walk close to them, it will tell us what these are. And here is a brook or a stream of some kind. We're going to go across the river. Once we go across the river, you can see that there's a castle mound and a drinking mound. And so I'm going to get another companion at the drinking mound ID. And we have discovered a river. You always, dis once you get close to a river, even if you have already discovered it before, you will discover it again. You'll see how that it has this kind of regular kind of cliff face here with the up arrows here. This is a mound. And this is when, when they were talking about hillocks, this is what a hillock is. And you can see that there's people inside it. There's all these exclamation marks. So we just have to find the door. So one of these is the castle mound and the other one is the drinking mound. And I think it doesn't matter which one we go to first. Ah, you also see this little scent sign here. That is the entrance to a kind of dwelling, which I will go down for fun. You can see some people are talking. Now, if I go down below here, you can see here's a here's kind of a dwelling. And there's lots of people here. You can see it's quite quite convoluted in here. There's quite a lot of people. So if I look, so that's me there. And so there's a muscular potter, this thin bone carver. That's a bed. I, I didn't show you before. It's kind, of, it's kind of like an O with a line through it. Um, and that's a bed. There are several bags. If we look inside the bag, let's look inside the first bag, A. See, it's full of plump helmets. We can actually take the plump, plump helmets if we want. Uh, I'm not going to probably do it because we have lots of food at the moment. Plump helmets are kind of mushroom. Who will we talk to? Let's talk to the muscular woodburner. We can say hello. He say, my name is Adel Bannerhusht. Life is, in a word, day. Because we we worship the day. And then Vabak Reganil says, hello, I'm Vabak Gloved Glories. So now what I'm going to do, and this is useful to do anytime you go to a new place, is we're going to talk with them again. The first thing you want to do is you want to ask about the surrounding area. Now they live in this area, surrounding areas. There we go. So tell me about the area. And then he says the hills of strife, I had to press space for more. It says the hills of strife is a half day's travel to the west. Wombats roam freely there. Now what's cool about this is I now go to Q. I go to B for bestiary and I go down to Wombats, which I think I have to page down a few bit. There we go, the Wombats are here. And you will see that it now shows up in my bestiaries. The creatures live in the Hills of Strife. So that's that's essentially why you want to do that. It, it uh, gives you some more information. I don't think it gives you any information except for the bit that you just asked about. But it gives you just a little bit more information about what you can find in different places. And if I ask again for more, he'll tell me more. He says the virtuous hills, so the days travel to the southeast, and a uh, Ficard creature trade was struck down by a giant dingo. So it's not particularly interesting hanging around here. So I'm going to go back up. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask about the local ruler and the most Lancers rules furnace tapers. It's for the best. I just talk with him again. I can ask him how strong the group's hold is over its lands. They do not feel challenged at all. Just move to the right and then go up. And I've noticed the door is over here. And what do I find in here? This is farmer, clothier, paper maker, 
that's the administrator for the town. So this is must be the castle mount. I actually want to find the drinking mount. This looks like a drinking mount to me. Oh no. Okay, this is full of drunks. And the sheriff. Alright, so we can get a drunk to join us. So which would you rather have? Would you rather have a sunken eyed dwarf, thin dwarf, short ears, or greasy haired? Thin one might actually have good agility. So let's talk with him. Great listener. Hello, I'm Bomrek Machine Closes. Let's just ask a little bit. We want to interview them slightly. So let's ask about your family. He has no family to speak of, so if he dies, no one cares. That's probably a good thing. Let's state our values. We want to find someone. We want to see if the person is loyal. So although my own insignificant beliefs lie elsewhere, I admire how brilliant you are. So basically, they... Um, flattered us. They don't really believe in loyalty. So we agree to drop the argument. And then Barmung says, Great beast threatens to bring ruin upon our people. Queen Rocks is in the hill of confidence. Seek this place if you hunt Dur Search Sculpted, the large call of saviors, the bronze colossus. He has killed 84 in its lust for murder. Uh, there's no way we can, we can uh, survive against that. But if we talk to him, we can find out where he is. So the Bronze Colossus, so where is this Bronze Colossus? Or we can ask for directions to Queen Rocks, which is where um, it is. So this will actually put us on our map. Ah, we have to ask Lead Tell Whip. So let's ask about Lead Tell Whip. There we go. Where is Lead Tell Whip? Lead Tell Whip is somewhere in a hillock to the east. So we could actually find Lead Tellock. Since that person's well traveled, before we actually uh, commit to getting a drunk, maybe we should ask Led Tellwhip if he'll join us. Now, unfortunately, you can't tell whose name names people are. I imagine he's the military commander, though. Let's ask the military commander. This is yeah. So the military commander is Led Tellwhip. So I don't think he'll join us. Let's just. So if we ask for directions to Queen Rocks, then it's far to the east, and now it gets added to our map. So if I say capital Q, and I search for sites, I completely forget what it was we were looking for again. Queen Rocks. Capital Q, S for sites, F, Queen Rocks, good enough. And then Z, you can see all the way over there to the east. Now, if I then converse with him again and we say, hey, how about joining us? He probably won't because he's military commander. Um, and, but if he did, it'd be great. So, and I can never uh, ask the listener to join us. Would you like to join us on our adventures? I'm sorry, my duty's here. Poor bomb wreck is going to get drafted into service uh, as a companion. Because it's good to have two companions. So I don't want a greasy haired drunk. But Bomrick, Stakudrol, so. And what we're going to do is ask him to join us and he will join us for sure because he's drunk. That sounds like a great idea. So now I have two companions. And I think that's what we're going to leave at it for today. I think we've probably gone a very, very long time. I'm not sure how long it's been. I'll probably edit out quite a lot of it. But I hope you enjoyed the adventure so far today. And we'll see you again next time.